Well, politics as defined by the geographical and influential spheres of this country is irrelevant to black people and is irrelevant to the masses of people. The vote has been used as a tool of oppression against black people. I mean, Camus raises a very good point when he says, what better way to enslave a man than give him the vote and call him free? He said, it does not profit black people or poor people anything to have the vote and not be able to select the candidates who they want to choose. Now, how can you choose between London Johnson, Nixon, Agnew, Wallace, and Humphrey? There is no choice. Evil is evil. There's nothing in between that. There were some lesser candidates. Uh, Dick Gregory uh, was running for office. Eldridge Cleaver. I think the vote can only be used as a tool of organization. We can only use the vote to organize our people. Now, to really believe that we can put someone in office and that these people would be responsive to our needs is naive, politically naive. Because even if one of the black candidates who ran for office was to take the office of president, then black people must be prepared to fight against that person. Why? Because, you see, the system mandates the action of the individual. The individual does not determine how this country will function. This country works off the military-industrial complex, which means that it's profitable to wage war. And unless you, you know, devise another plan, or another scheme to s sustain, or uh, to boost this economy, then it's going to be necessary to wage war, whether, you know, a black individual is in, is in office or a white individual is in office. Well, so we're talking about a complete uh, a change in system. Uh, if Mr. Cleaver did win the election, don't you think that he could have conducted uh, the presidency in a unique manner that may not be, you know, compromising to the system you speak of? No, because, you, as I said, the system dictates the response oh, of yeah. individuals. You see, individuals do not influence you know, politically, economically, or socially I see. the attitudes or functioning of the system. Well, if politics as we know it here in this country is not the answer, what is? I think there has to be a reevaluation of politics. Now, there are definitions of politics that are relevant to black people. Chairman Mao says that politics is war without bloodshed and war is an extension of politics. I think black people have to begin to address themselves to the politics of revolution, because we are caught up in revolutionary struggle whether we want to believe it or whether we want to be or not. So I think, you know, black people have to begin to think in a revolutionary fa fashion and create and construct a politically revolutionary platform. Is this going to be a race revolution or is it going to be a class revolution? I think, you know, like in terms of struggle and who will comprise the revolutionary uh, front of that struggle. It will be oppressed people. You see, black people are in the vanguard position of the struggle because we've been the most dispossessed. However, there are other oppressed people in this country. Mexican-American, the Spanish-American community, the Puerto Ricans, American Indian, Japanese-Americans, and even poor whites. But racism, I don't believe that racism will allow poor whites to form alliances with the revolutionary gr groups in this country. Do you feel that black people will ever have a strong political voice in this country in the formal sense as we understand it? You mentioned that you don't think that this could ever come about. Uh, is there any chance that it might? No, I, see, I think that's a reformist, you know, like, position to assume for me to say that people, black people, will one day occupy in this system political offices of importance. Now. You know, this brings on a whole discussion of control, you see, and how you control. Because anything that you don't control is used as a weapon against you. Now, in terms of black people occupying positions, America has created in Cleveland, Washington, D.C., and Gary, Indiana, a type of neo-colonialism. In other words, the man has set up a puppet regime. These black people they are responsive to the needs and the realms of the Democratic Party and not of the masses of black people. If who's ever pre who have, who, I'm sorry, if Johnson is president or whoever is president were to tell Stokes or Hatcher or Walter Washington to send black people to concentration camps, then there would be no discussion because they would see it as their job because they hold a position that's, you know, responsive or that's sensitive to the Democratic Party. Do you view those that are in prominent positions that are black uh, sort of a token uh, gesture on the part of the establishment, like a member of the Supreme Court bench that was a black member of the cabinet and so forth? Uh, 
I think that has to be examined in the sense of progress and as to whether black people have made progress in this country. Mm -hmm. My contention is that black people have not made progress in this country. America has given blacks um, some concessions out of political necessity, their political necessity. They gave Thurgood Marshall a position on the Supreme Court to appease black people. In other words, we didn't put Thurgood Marshall there. They can take Thurgood Marshall whenever they get ready. We put Adam in office. They took Adam out. They gave black people an astronaut, and they killed him. So what happens is that that has to be viewed in the light of concessions. The very fact that the man can concede a position to you tells you that you do not have a position of power where you can demand, or that you can mandate something. How do you think that the press has affected uh, the black situation in this country? I think news media and media in general uh, are, are very negative in terms of any revolutionary movement or any movement that, you know, forces the change of the status quo. Now, media has always been an enemy of black people because what media has done is media has always singled out people who had vanguard positions or vanguard attitudes and tried to make these people an enemy of the masses of people. In our case, you know, like, make, make individuals enemies of black people. Malcolm X would be a good example. More Negroes feared Malcolm, Malcolm X than white people because news media told black people that Malcolm was bad. Muhammad Ali, the reason that Muhammad Ali could be given the maximum sentence and the maximum fine and the black community did not revolt was because Muhammad Ali had been made an enemy of black people. Adam Clayton Powell could be legally lynched, politically lynched, and black people did not revolt was because the man had told black people that Adam Clayton Powell was an uppity nigger. He had legitimatized his own action through news media. So the news media is a tool of oppression. What about your personal experience with the press? Do you feel that the press has given you a fair shake? You see, uh, in terms of myself as an individual, you know, whether I get coverage or not, it doesn't make any difference. But in terms of ideas, in terms of the flux of ideas, or the flow of ideas, right, your I, see that, yeah. Yeah, I, see, I see that the press has deliberately created a vacuum in terms of deliverance of attitudes or positions to the black community, which is to be expected. We cannot rely upon white news media to convey black revolutionary messages. So, you know, like the press is doing their job. And as to me, you know, like what happened to me last year with the press was that that was a boycott against me. ABC, NBC, and CBS. You know, anything that Brad Brown did, you know, like you blacked out. Cause, you know, just like that, no question about it. And this was the whole attitude that, had been, that has been assumed by news media. And black people do not control news media, so they cannot expect to turn on TV and find out what's going on in the black community. Just like, you know, for example, in New York Times, one of the biggest pieces of white nationalism that exists in the country. You have been uh, quoted in the media, and you have been given some exposure. I, I think what you're saying is that the quality of that exposure leaves something to be desired. Or do you feel that like you were ex totally excluded? I, you know, like it's not an exclusion of individuals. It's a, an exclusion of positions, of vanguard positions, which again, I say, you know, like news media being what it is and serving who it serves is to be expected of news media. I think, you know, like black people, the total community of black people are for a revolutionary change. Okay, so that's roughly 11%. And any group, any oppressed group, you know, who wants to better their situation out of necessity have to be, has to be for revolutionary change because the system is incapable of changing itself. So by the very fact that it is incapable of changing, it says that you're for revolutionary change. I see. It, it follows then that it will not be, uh, there's no way of forecasting when it's going to come about. Uh, it's sort of a pressure that is building constantly. See, as I said, I think revolution is an evolutionary process. I right. think as repression increases, people must respond to that repression. Now, the dilemma that the black movement is in today is that, you know, there's a divisi the d divisiveness that yeah. exists in the black community between what's considered cultural nationalists and political nationalists. Now, understand, the man or uh, system endorses cultural nationalism. He will give people money to open up dashiki sh shops, will give people money to open up bookstores, because he knows that if you keep the people thinking culturally, then they won't move politically. My position is that culture has to be political. Everything has to be political. And in terms of the struggle 
that political direction will, you know, give rise to the revolutionary struggle as a result of the repression that will be brought down because of political struggle. See, I think that it's significant to note that the laws that have been passed in this country for the past, past 10 years have been laws of a repressive nature to deal with black people. In other words, the Omnibus Crime Bill speaks directly to black people. So the Anti-Riot Bill tells black people when they can travel, how they can travel, and if they can travel. The McCarran Act of 1950, Internal Security, which came as a result of the Internal Security Act, created concentration camps in this country for black people. And so I think, you know, like in terms of the repression and in terms of the role of the vanguard groups, I think the, the role of the vanguard group is to bring that repression down before the timetable that has been set up by the system runs its full course. I think it's our responsibility to get the masses involved. And the way you get the masses involved is that you bring the repression down. When you begin to execute political programs, then it, out of necessity, the system have to do, has to do certain things to control or try to you know, put it in to the type of political action that you're executing. And by doing this, they involve the masses of people. The masses of people, from our position, from our viewpoint, it's unorganizable. You can't hope to organize the masses of people. Oppression organizes the masses of people. White folks make more revolutionaries than I ever could make. Well, let's go back a bit. Let's backtrack. What happened with you and SNCC? Why did you uh, leave? Well, my term in, as chairman expired. Yeah. And, you know, like, there was an election, and Brother Phil Hutchins was elected program secretary. There was a restructuring of the organization because what had happened was that the man had effectively directed his repression, repressive laws against individuals. And when this had happened, you know, it, it created a vacuum. When I was off the scene, you know, like people who respond to me would not respond to other individuals. So what we did, we created a decentralized type of decentralization occurred in whereby we created other people to be spokesmen. See, people have to get out of the idea that individuals lead movements. See, it's the revolutionary is the individual who's on the other side of that camera. These are the people who will make the revolution. They have responsibilities to the revolution and to themselves. And, you know, like, if individuals articulate positions, it's perhaps because they have public forums, not because they know more than anybody else, not because they are more oppressed than anybody else. So black people have to begin to understand the role that they have to play in that revolution is determined by them. What about the future for you, Rap? Where will you fit in as this revolutionary process evolves? Ah, uh, good question. In terms of the legal cases that I have in court now, the man, you know, like, is moving against me as an individual to put me away, to get rid of me and get me off, you know, out the streets. Now, I think, you know, everything hinges and pins upon the nature of the struggle that's conducted in this country. If black people wage successful revolutionary struggle in this country, then every black cat in jail, you know, he doesn't have to worry about being in prison because he's black. But, you know, my fate as the fate of, fate of, you know, every other black person in this country depends upon what we do. You feel that you, uh, that the law is truly, justice is truly blind? Do you feel that it's a... No, justice ain't blind. Just to see white folks mighty well. As a matter of fact, justice means just us white folks in this country. See, for black people, justice is a joke. No such thing as justice in this country for black people. The courts are a tool of oppression. The courts, you know, like, help to execute the genocide, the type of genocide that has been practiced against black people in this country for 400 years. Why is it that uh, there's not much exposure about what you feel, if it is true, that uh, justice is not blind, that it does uh, favor one segment of the society? Why isn't it attacked more by uh, responsible agencies? <laughs> the very reason that they're responsible means that, they, you know, the very statement responsible agents say that they are not going to respond because you know, like in terms of the status quo the status quo is never attacked by the comfortable people the people who you know, profit from it and so as to expect you know the responsible Negroes or the responsible white people you know to attack the system from the basis that poor people and oppressed people will attack it you know is out of the question you say that America as it stands just just cannot be as far as a black man is concerned. Does this mean that the, the democratic idea 
not how it's practiced, but the idea of a democracy is not valid? Uh, I think that in terms of, you know, like, there has been no successful example of democracy as it's taught in this country. Not in, not, I'm not even talking about as it's practiced. I'm talking about as it's taught in this country. How about the Constitution? Looks good on paper. I think, you know, the Constitution has a lot of valid ideas and thoughts. But you see that the contradictions that exist in this country are created out of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. I mean, otherwise, you know, like, you know, the Constitution is nothing but white people's paper. You know, it's advantageous and it's favorable for white people. They created con contradictions to the con Constitution when they added the 14th, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. Rap, what effect is the end of the Vietnam War going to have on the situation here in this country? I think that if, you know, like America has ever run out of Vietnam and defeated as they should be in Vietnam, then black people over here will have to, you know, like, be in a position where they can defend themselves. Because I think that aggression, that aggression that's being directed against the Vietnamese people will be turned inwardly against black people in this country. See, America, in terms of where she goes and, you know, like, who she controls, a whole sphere of influence is diminishing. America is fighting on about five or six different fronts right now. Latin America, you know, like Africa, Middle East, and Vietnam, and here domestically. So I think that, you know, given the system and given that it operates off the military industrial complex, which means that war is profitable and that, you know, like General Steel, or USS Steel, must make steel for tanks to hire people, you know, to give people jobs to, so they can spend the money to buy other goods. The very fact that the system operates off that principle mean that, means that when the man comes back, when the man is run out of every country, then it will become necessary to wage war in his own country. This is an utter contradiction to what a lot of politicians said, that when the war in Vietnam ends, then we can use all that money to sort of solve our racial ills here. No, it's not true, you see, because money has never been a problem for this country in terms of allotting money, because, you see, money here is not based on gold, it's not really based on the goods that produce. This is a lie that's been told. And it's been sold to black people as green power. Green power is a myth. See, because as long as a man change, possesses the power to change the color of money, then, you know, like the color of money is not significant in struggle. He can give black people the, all the green money in the world and tell them they're using red money tomorrow. Black people have to go work for red money. In terms of what he did to the international monetary system, now, the United States has a budget, annual budget of $800 billion. They had only $12 billion worth of gold. Now, in terms of their foreign spending, it exceeded the quantity of gold that they had in this country. So France was putting pressure on the United States by demanding payment in gold of it from paper currency. So what the United States did was that the United States said, OK, we're going to change the rules. They put pressure on the international monetary system, and they changed the whole international monetary standards from gold to paper gold. And they did that because they had power, not because the money they had was so good. They had power. Thank you, Ray.